40 million infected people is a fucking plague and nobody acts as if it is. Nobody here either, nobody in this hospital, nobody in this city, nobody in this world. Kramer repeats, hands now in the air, his eyes piercing into the audience below him. 40 million people is a fucking plague. My name is Tanner Lamb, and I will be discussing the immense impact Larry Kramer had on the world we live in today and how his aggressive rhetorical style helped him create that impact, as well as his lasting legacy on the gay community. Lawrence David Kramer was born into a Jewish family in 1935. When Larry Kramer was just six, his father obtained a job as a government attorney and moved the family down to Washington, D.C. Like so many of us, being a young gay man was hard for Kramer. He was often overshadowed by his older brother. While Arthur was out playing basketball with his friends, Larry would play alone, coming up with and acting out plays and stories in the backyard. The turbulent relationship he shared with his father laid the groundwork for Kramer's rhetorical style in the future. He always picked on me, he always yelled at me, and occasionally hit me. I was a creative person whose creativity was always looked on as suspect by my parents. These verbal altercations and assertions of power ultimately led Kramer to the to be the combative polemicist we know today. This experience, while not shared by the whole community, is one that I can personally relate to as well. Kramer always felt as though he was an outsider, a person nobody understood. This feeling of exclusion followed him throughout his ac academic career at Yale, his father's alma mater. In 1953, his feelings of inadequacy and self-loathing had been boiling up inside of him, finally released in the form of a suicide attempt that same year. It was his brother Arthur, and through a quote, liberating experience with a male professor that would show Kramer he was a valuable member of not only society, but the gay community. Kramer graduated in 1957, and after serving a tour in the Vietnam War, he started working for Columbia Pictures. He was sent to, he was sent to London to work as a production executive on popular films such as Lawrence of, the Arabia, Lawrence of Arabia and Dr. Strangelove. When returning to the U.S. in 1972, Kramer wrote and produced a screen adaptation of D.H. Lawrence's Woman in Love. The production garnered wide mass appeal and was a box office hit, even earning him a few Academy Award nominations and an Oscar win for Glenda Jackson. After his initial success, Kramer saw an opportunity to do more. He wanted, to, he wanted work on projects that were more true to himself as a gay man. After working as a producer for roughly the next decade, Kramer saw his affection for the movie industry waning. Because he was not allowed to make movies in, with gay themes, Kramer turned to writing and released his, the, his first novel, Faggots, in 1978. A controversial book that drew a hardline stance on the promiscuity in the gay community and how it was destroying gay men. Some saw his words as a scathing attack on their way of life and others saw it as an accurate depiction of what was really happening out on Fire Island and other places across the country. The book divided and stigmatized a large portion of the gay community, eventually leading to a loss of credit among his own peers. Baggett's drew a line in the sand between Kramer and a significant number of gay men who saw him as an old-fashioned moralist and even a hysteric. In reality, however, Kramer defended his work, saying it was a critique on gay men and women who solely defined themselves on their sexual orientation. At that point, Kramer had become aware of the growing fear of this new gay cancer that was striking down gay men by the day. But it wasn't until Dr. Lawrence Mass, who was one of the six co-founders of the Gay Men's Health Crisis, wrote a health column for the only gay newspaper in town that he felt the exigency to, to that he felt the exigency of the situation. He, along with a few other gay men, started me meeting weekly to relay new information and spread awareness on AIDS. In 1982, these meetings would eventually become the foundation for the Gay Men's Health Crisis an organization set up by Kramer and his constituents to increase community awareness as well as push for governmental action. And in his landmark essay, 1,112 and Counting, published on the front page of the New York Native in 1983, Kramer uses mostly exigency to encourage mass communication about the disease. This essay, unlike his other work, was not as combative as the rest. While still calling out people by name for their inadequacy to take action, this essay was more a cry for help rather than aggressive attack, which was what Kramer had been known for at this time. I'd like to take a closer look at this essay and what rhetorical strategies he employs to spark fear and action within his readers. Kramer's main, rhetor main rhetorical device used within this work is exigency, defined as an urgent need or demand. And it was just that. This, this can be seen in his first few words, quote, if this article doesn't scare the shit out of you, then we're all in trouble. 
If this article doesn't rouse you to anger, fury, rage, action, gay men have no future on this earth. Not only can you feel the emotion bubbling up inside him, it's palatable from the moment you start reading. His extreme use of pathos revolves around his anger and sparking that same anger within his readers. In this introduction, Kramer also sets up another one of his rhetorical themes that will continually pop up within all of his writing. The repetition of the first word or phrase called anaphora. He uses this strategy to build momentum while getting to the climax of a point he's trying to make. On, in the text, he states, after almost two years of an epidemic, there is still no answers. After almost two years of an epidemic, the cause for AIDS remains unknown. After two years of an epidemic, there is no cure. Kramer's demands and actions, while aggressive, have always been consistent. He has, all, he has only ever pleaded for the government support and for the life-saving drugs for his friends and family. On page seven, towards the end of the article, Kramer makes a slight shift. His emotional appeal has now trapped his audience into hearing what he has to say. This was Kramer's genius. He would lead you in with his emotional appeal and shove you onto his side with a myriad of logical arguments that leave you feeling angry and full of fear. Kramer states, that would be a wash if there weren't 164 cases in 28 days. That would wash if case numbers hadn't jumped from 41 to 1,112 in just 18 months. That would wash if cases in one city, New York, hadn't jumped into 15 countries and 35 other states. That would wash if cases weren't coming in at more than four times a day nationally and two times a day locally. That would wash if the mortality rate didn't start at 38% the first year of diagnosis and climb to a grotesque 86% after three years. Get your stupid heads out of the sand, you turkeys. These facts and statistics scare the shit out of me, and his use of anaphora further emphasizes the time-sensitive nature of his argument. Oftentimes, Kramer's words can be taken out of context. When looking back at the epidemic, his rhetoric and, and the rhetoric that followed it, but he... Oftentimes, Kramer's words can be taken out of context when looking back at the epidemic and his rhetoric that followed it. But here you can see his polemic language and aggressive attacks were completely justified. Rick Burke, executive editor, editor at Stat, states, that was the genius behind Larry Kramer. He, was, he made us squirm. He never let up. There was no time to finesse because people were dying. The lack of finesse his lack of finesse was what led Kramer to eventually part ways with the men's health crisis and created ACT UP in 1987, a more militant group, in line with Kramer's rhetoric. Kramer's combative language and methods were not questioned there. If anything, they were encouraged. Greg Gonslevs joined ACT UP in the early 90s and said that, and said that he had never seen a group more devoted to their work, stating in an interview after Kramer's death, there, he met LGBTQ people who were interested in science, politics, and who would meet together to devour great e, the great E. Paul Williams immunology textbook one night and chain themselves together in front of a drug, comp er, drug company's headquarters on the next day. Kramer's, Kramer and ACT UP became known as a fierce and angry activist. Their emotion was infused into, in, into every syllable and every word that would shout at the government and drug companies. But Kramer didn't always use shouting and anger as a persuasion tactic. The 1985 Broadway debut of his play The Normal Heart was a great example of a more pulled back, restrained Kramer, one who let the pathos-infused story slowly take its toll on the viewers. This production was an autobiographical play based on, his li based on his own life. It was beautiful and tragic all at the same time, and while it shared with us the anger that he perpetually held on to, it also showed us more. The play showed us a softer, more fragile side of Kramer, one whose fears include not being heard and the death of those closest. These would be the three plagues that, along with AIDS, that would seem to follow Kramer throughout the rest of his life and his rhetoric. But this softness does not last. His combative style can be seen again when he's introduced himself to Dr. Anthony Fauci, who still, who still heads the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases um, and was a longtime friend of Kramer. His first experience with Kramer when he published an, was when he published an open letter addressed to Dr. Fauci on the cover of the San Francisco Examiner. The first line stating, an open letter to the incompetent idiot Dr. Anthony Fauci. I call you a murderer. After gaining his attention, it opened up a dialogue between gay men struggling with this disease 
and the government who's doing little to help. Dr. Fauci later stated in an interview for Kramer's obituary that once you got past his rhetoric, you found that Larry Kramer made a lot of sense and had a heart of gold. People who understood why he was attacking these people were not offended by his rhetoric. If anything, they were inspired by it. Dr. Fauci knew that being targeted by Kramer was not a personal as people took it, unless of course you were somehow considered a bigot. What Kramer was actually attacking was the establishment that you represented. He had a visceral hatred for people who had the opportunity to do something about all these dying men and chose to stay silent. Luckily for Dr. Fauci, he didn't stay silent. Working together, and Kramer, working together, they were able to speed up FDA process, the FDA process of releasing new drug treatments as well as increasing awareness of the disease overall. His rhetoric, while aggressive, almost 100% of the time was justified, and it worked. Larry Kramer passed away only one month ago. Yet while the world has eyes on a new global pandemic taking hold, I can't help but feel the anger and rage towards the new government and how they're handling this pandemic. Kramer during his lifetime used his voice as a catalyst for change. He knew what he was fighting for was beyond just himself. He saw friends and lovers die before his eyes. He saw the government that, that was supposed to protect do nothing. He saw an opportunity to make a change and took it by force. His polemic rhetoric still reverberates in the ears of many today, but at his core, Kramer was a kind-hearted man who just felt as though he was living through a genocide. His anger and rage completely understandable. He would often draw comparison to the AIDS epidemic and to the Holocaust. But beyond, the ins but beyond inspiring others to make change, he also made, him he made it for himself. Tom Frieden, a physician and president and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives, had this to say about Kramer. I believe that Larry Kramer fundamentally changed the world of medical research. He made Tony Fauci and other realize that it is not ethical to deny treatment when no proven treatments exist. That if an experimental treatment is being developed, then you've got to figure out a way to accelerate them. Kramer changed the way drugs are tested and released in the United States, as well as facing the government and drug companies head on. Larry, quote, Larry laid the groundwork for a new generation of health activists. He, sta he started a new style of in-your-face activism that was valid and changed health advocacy and service organizations and organizations who focused on creating structural changes to help better people's lives. Kramer's life long was long even after his diagnosis with AIDS in 1988. He used this life to the fullest extent possible and lived as loud as he could. So my question is to you, what will you do in your life to make noise for the ones who aren't being heard?